Hello and welcome. Um, so I have a snow day today and I was thinking about a few things and I figured I'd make just a little rambly video a bit. I actually have notes and everything that I want to look at during it just to keep myself on track because I am a bit of a rambly person. But I've been thinking about a few things recently, aside from the ghost stories that are all of a sudden in my YouTube feed that I plan on watching today. Um, <clears throat> so just jumping straight into it, the first thing would be the democratization of healthcare, um, affordability and sustainability within healthcare. So the concept of democratization, it arms people with information to use their autonomy better in healthcare and it provides a sense of agency. It empowers patients. Um, it makes it easier to make a decision. It makes it easier for participants as far as, you know, doctors, nurses, when their patients are better informed. Um, yeah, I have here that I think that it's interesting that people believe that human ingenuity regarding healthcare, research discovery, and things of the like would stop without. I mean, I live here in America, so I don't know where you're watching this from, but that these things would stop that capitalistic competition and in a single payer system when it's been demonstrated that it can remain innovative without being primarily a capitalistic enterprise. So we have issues with that here as far as you're kind of at the will of maybe not the state of deciding who you go to see, which unless you have uh, the social component of Medicaid, Medicare, something like that. Um, but you're at the will of insurance companies who are far less inclined <laughs> to help people be well because they would not make any money. Um, and that goes to say that access to dental care for adults, even with Medicaid, is only covering surgical corrections. Um, and until, like, even until now, of 2020, cosmetic issues of missing teeth or teeth that might appear poorly maintained that have root and genetic predispositions, etc., impact things like perception. When you're missing teeth or when you come across somebody that's missing teeth, occasionally the perception might be that there's somebody that probably doesn't take very good care of themselves. This is a similar uh, instinct when we see people that are larger, that they don't take care of themselves, or you make automatic assumptions about them. Maybe it's due to some sort of choice. Um, maybe they're not a safe person to be around. It's just one of those things of perception that I find it very interesting that we still don't afford that right to everyone when it's honestly one of the most underutilized specialties and not a lot of people receive dental care, even children here in America. Um, the current infrastructure of healthcare being private or government, since there is no standard, there can be no cohesion or affordability. So I think that pretty much speaks for itself. I'm kind of reading off the bulletin points <laughs> and I'll, I kind of expound as far as if I think that it needs it or not. Healthcare workers are a finite resource because there are only so many working and staying in the field. Many leaving after only a few years or transitioning from hospital to outpatient facilities, which my time in healthcare was primarily in neurology, um, neurology and epilepsy, and I saw this every year. Every year that I was there, half of the nursing staff would leave one of, not, it wasn't a fellow, he was one of our attendings, he left to pursue business because he was tired of medicine, he was tired of 
um, the bureaucracy within medicine. And when a, one of the nurses went to start a bookstore, a lot of them experienced burnout, which caregiver burnout and mental health is only in recent years being addressed among those providing care. While some hospitals still don't offer comprehensive enough benefits that even working that for those working in healthcare aren't even afforded the ability to receive the benefits that they might advocate to patients for, which is absurd. Um, healthcare workers are a resource, and since they're limited, they're precious and should not be forced to overwork for the sake of hospital revenue and a risk to personal and patient safety. So that goes back to kind of the idea of affordability, creating a standard across the board, at least here, um, where you're able to provide those low patient loads or manageable patient loads, I should say, maybe not low, especially at a time like now, oh my goodness. <clears throat> I think that I'll skip over for now the shifting reality section to go into sexism and science, but generally in the workplace. And my recent experiences working no longer in healthcare, but in a research facility and a lab have been objectively horrifying. <laughs> um, so the idea of sexism, of gender-based violence, sexual harassment, things of that nature are a general issue in the world. And my recent experience was that there seems to be a notion that being assailed, physically aggressed by someone could be caused by miscommunication. Um, the person was a man. And I think that if I had slapped him in his face or aggressed him in a similar manner, that there would be no idea that it could be a miscommunication. I think probably because women are seen as docile. Um, and I, I, after, after experiencing that and after understanding, you know, sort of interlaying that into experiences that I've had with being sexually harassed at work with proof and that leading to no form of consequences for the man that perpetrated the action, um, feeling really no sense of agency as a woman in science and medicine and um, additionally, it's such a pervasive issue. Uh, workplace violence against women is a pervasive issue. Uh, so I have some statistics here because those are always fun and I think that it's, it's nice to have. Nine in 10 women in Mexico, according to a survey conducted in 2019, experienced sexual harassment. Here in America, as of 1993, according to Fitzgerald, who wrote for the American Psychologist, it's also posted on the NIH website, which you can look up if you'd like, um, the number in America as of 1993. Half. One out of two women will be sexually harassed during academic or professional careers. Is that not astounding? My, I couldn't, I can't reconcile that that there is pervasive, because sexual harassment is in a sense violence, because it creates an environment without safety. And when it's not properly addressed, it turns this sort of victimization um, inwards and where you might feel that it's really you and maybe the perpetration of such acts isn't about the person who did it, but it's about yourself. 
Um, so I just found that to be, you know, so those numbers predate the cultural attempts at reformation, like the Me Too movement and the glass ceiling uh, movement, which gained traction around the campaigning of Hillary Clinton, um, but was originally coined in 1978. But it was really from 2005 on where the glass ceiling, this ideology, which is backed by statistics and science of women not being paid as well, um, experiencing that type of violence, uh, harassment, uh, despite having similar educational backgrounds, if not more so. I mean, I know that I've experienced in both science and medicine being overlooked to answer questions that are pointed at male colleagues with less practical experience or technical education pertaining to the jobs that they might be doing. Um, and I think that those, that's some things that we have to work on. We're, we're, there's not enough diversity still in those places for women, for there to be um, for there to be like precedent, I feel like, to understand that certain actions, certain things are not okay. And because they're okay amongst male colleagues, they're not okay amongst female <laughs> and male colleagues. So there's shifting dynamics that are happening that aren't being accounted for in the environments that they're happening. And that's not your fault. That's not your fault. Somebody had to say it. So I will go into, I'll end on the spicy note uh, after this one. The idea of shifting realities is gaining so much notoriety. You see it on TikTok, you see it on YouTube, people are covering it on commentary channels, which always seem to pop up in my recommended. Um, I listen to a lot of binaural beats, kind of to help with sleep or meditation, and you see people using them to be able to shift to Hogwarts or to other sort of like fantastical places, and I kind of wanted to to analyze maybe some of the mechanisms. So, as of right now, there seems to be a palpable cognitive dissonance that is becoming more and more pervasive amongst people, whether it be this prolonged lockdown or sort of bleak predictive programming that we see in movies where the future is headed in abysmal directions <laughs> that people are kind of giving up. And so in my mind, this idea of shifting reality is kind of obviating responsibility to reality. And it's a marker of the serious abstractions that are the bedrock for most of our humanity's major foundings like government, economy, law, um, society at large, and the cultures that we form within it, which is in itself culture. We define that. It's, it's just an abstraction. It's something that there really doesn't have to be rules for, but we've made them. So people feel as though they can't be happy in this world, that there's no opportunities for them. This disillusionment and the demographic for those seeking out shift reality videos, shifting TikToks, is within a majority of younger individuals, I'd, I'd probably say most of the comments, because I wanted to look it up before doing this, most of the comments people were, even though you're supposed to be 18 to be able to use YouTube, I thought that's what it was, but um, it ranged from 14 
to 22. So we can we can safely say like teenage to to mid early adulthood. And I think that demographic is important because we are failing them if they think that the only way to live a better and more idyllic life is to disappear from this reality and to disappear from this world. I've had a lot of conversations with a younger sister-like figure, I guess, and her fears over climate change, of not being able to grow into old age, are warranted. Uh, Science says that it's warranted and that she probably should worry about that. But it's one without a lot of solution. So I can understand that seeking a sense of control, someone, if they thought this was possible, do this. Um, so let's talk about what the common shifting realities are. Places with inherent magical or fantastical themes, like Harry Potter, worlds with dragons, like Game of Thrones, things like that, or idealized versions of pre-existing lives, where people script themselves as these idyllic versions of themselves where they have the perfect body, the perfect parents, the perfect amount of money, and these are all social parameters of what it means to be perfect. And this is part of where I sense that we've failed. We haven't shown diverse enough forms of life, diverse enough forms of success, diverse forms of beauty, And I mean in a real way and not in a virtue signaling way where they toss one person in who is a little chubby or toss one person in who is darker and say, there you go. That's your, you can use that as your form of beauty. There has to be a way to incorporate all forms of being into what we show. Even shows that attempt to show the real life of being a teenager, of being, because that's really who this is speaking to. And they're the primary demographic for YA fan fictions, for television shows such as Euphoria. And even in those demonstrations of what it can be to live a real life, to live an authentic life, there's very often a lack of diversity as far as not everyone's beautiful. That's just a fact. Um, Because there'd be no standard and no way there'd be no, if there's no deviation, then there can be no point at which we arrive at yes, that person is gorgeous. That person, it's not gorgeous because there's an asymmetry, which it's subjective. But that subjectivity comes from culture. So it comes back down again to there has to be some sort of cultural reformation that's involved in younger people feeling a sense of hope, a sense of ability, to lead lives that they would like to lead while not removing themselves from reality. It's far too close, in my opinion, to... um, What's the psychological term for it? Or you leave reality, but you're still here, not to, not to solution it. I don't know, I can't think of it. You can probably think of it. Like I said, this is a rambly video. I don't edit, so if you don't like that. And to end it on the spice, you meet, Bo. So, I want to talk 
about because it's been on my mind for so long. It's been on my mind for so, so long. The prosecutorial nature of the video essay and the virtue signaling by calling out those with problematic behavior. So it's something that we often see scrolling the grids of YouTube and our suggestions that at least one commentary video will come up. They've risen in popularity in recent years, so they've been picked up by the algorithm. Though intent may be one of vicarious punishment to admonish the behavior occurring and stating why it might not be appropriate or socially acceptable, quite often it does not meet this end as much as it provides an outlet for misdirected rage or outrage, I guess you could say, because that's when it's on the outside. Uh, as an interconnected species, there's larger issues that are so abstract that we will find something to assign our frustration to. Does that mean I agree with doing things that harm others, mislead others, or that those performing some of the actions aren't in need of a talking to? No, of course not. Does it mean then that I agree that making multiple videos on someone being an idea thief when phenomena like multiple discovery theory exist and thus paints someone else as a plagiarist and destroy their credibility, their livelihood, or ability to finance themselves, their passion for the subject in question, or greater, they take their lives? Which I don't know if we've seen that as much as I feel we will see it with the prevalence of commentary channels becoming these behavioral correction forms. I don't know, I'll get into that, but I think that it should be understood that most people are upset at the institutions that the actions are a part of and not at the people, i.e. racism, misrepresentation of selves, theft, wealth inequality, uh, these are grander ideas that, as, as a singular person, you might feel powerless to, might feel that in no way you could affect. But given this venue of criticizing someone who elicits this behavior, you justifiably attack them with rage. You feel, I, I know, I should, I should reconstruct that. You feel justified in pointing your rage at that person. Um, so I've seen people congratulate themselves on the su successful cancellation of others or attempt to analyze people's attempts at apology and call them ingenuous and sincere, um, hacky, <laughs> I guess, which if you don't know someone personally, you might not know the manner that's comfortable for them to apologize. Some people are incapable of apology. So providing one, if you're a person who rarely apologizes, is huge. But you wouldn't know that. So here we get into that the umbrella term that no one is perfect, which that is not an attempt at absolution, but it can be a moralistic metaphor of compassion. No one is perfect. And while if you have a public image, your failures, your mistakes, are broadcast, it doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't mean that you're without fault ever, just like the people that make the videos, which I'll get into. So people flock to commentary channels and deep dive channels whose sole purpose is the dismantling of not just behavior, but in a sense, someone's view of themselves. 
acting as an artificial superego because what is posted is essentially the original person's idea of themselves rather than the reality of who they are. So even the concept, the device of making a commentary on essentially what is a commentary on someone's view of themselves is it's a false equivocation to make it about the person about the actions of a person which like I said there are some people that rightfully need to be addressed and talked to So, but, so, that gives the idea that there's so much room for distortion and harm. I want to stay on track, because <laughs> this video is already so long. Uh, these channels rise more and more, and They've become sort of moral arbiters of the acceptable and unacceptable forms of apology, behavior, standards of living, and the concept, uh, the comment sections, they teeth with people asking for specific people to be covered, people that they're ready to see torn down. And it begs the question, at what point is this destructive analysis? Because it is one without dialogue or agency for the person being criticized actually just as harmful as the original action. And just like before, of course I'll add a disclaimer, of course that can't be assigned to all things such as pedophilia, murder, forms of abuse, harm. Um, but it, insinuations about people because of trivialities that might be ethically permissible or on a cultural basis not morally permissible do we run into issues like i said before calling people plagiarists making videos about people being simps uh deconstructing people's life choices that while outside of the norm aren't harmful aren't inherently harmful and might even provide people with a sense that there's diverse ways of living. So to that end, I guess I would just say that we're humans. We're humans and we're learning and I think we can do better and I think that we can try. Thank you for coming and have a great day.